Hey guys, welcome to another installment of Hilliard at Home. Today's topic is structuralism, which is a set of theoretical ideas that emerged in the mid-20th century and laid the groundwork for the post-structuralist theories that became so widespread and influential in the latter half of that century. Structuralist theory definitely falls under the category of post-humanism, so it may be helpful to review the video on post-humanism before you proceed with this one. So, what is structuralism? Well, structuralism first emerged in the early 20th century as a linguistic theory, a theory about the structure of language, developed by Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure. But it evolved into a much broader theoretical framework for the analysis of a wide range of cultural products and practices. Consequently, it's played an important role in the development of areas like literary studies, anthropology, sociology, political science, and more. Within the field of literary studies, structuralism provided an important response to formalism, which was the predominant mode of literary analysis in the early decades of the 20th century. So we'll begin with a brief overview of formalism. As a literary theory, formalism was the first attempt to professionalize literary studies as a modern academic discipline, and it drew very heavily from the humanist tradition that had been so prominent since the Renaissance period. There's a whole Hilliard at Home video on humanism that you can review if necessary. But at the core of the humanist tradition was a faith in human agency, the power of human beings, individually and collectively, to determine their own destiny. Powered by this faith, formalism understood the human individual to be a unique creative force, and it understood the work of literature to be an expression of the author's unique creative vision. Formalist criticism, then, involved close attention to the internal relationships within the text, the interactions between the various components of the text, without reference to anything outside of the text. A formalist critic might acknowledge that a particular text has historical, political, or social significance, but to analyze the text as a work of literary art, one must bracket off those historical, political, and social aspects of the text, otherwise known as context, and focus only on the unique artistic form of the work. Now, I think we would all agree that one important part of the context for any literary work is the literary tradition itself. In other words, anyone who writes literature has been influenced by the literary works of others. But formalist critics like R.S. Crane argued that it's even important that we disregard literary context when analyzing a text, because if we are focused on comparing it to other works of literature, we will blind ourselves to the unique creative vision of that author. Crane described the task of formalist criticism as making formal sense out of any literary work before us on the assumption that it may in fact be a work for whose peculiar principles of structure there are nowhere any usable parallels either in literary theory or in our experience of other works. In short, Crane and other formalist critics rejected any type of comparative analysis between texts. This brings us to structuralism, because structuralist theory argues that truly meaningful insights into literature can only come through comparative analysis. This argument stems from the structuralist's post-humanist understanding of authorship. So, again, within the humanist tradition, the author was understood as a unique creative force, the origin point for unique creations. French theorist Michel Foucault, a critic of humanism, referred to this humanist author figure as the author god. Now, another French theorist, Roland Barthes, gives us a really great metaphor for understanding the structuralist's post-humanist notion of authorship. Barthes describes the author as a shaman. In many traditional cultures, the shaman is an important figure who transmits from generation to generation the stories through which the people of that culture understand themselves and their relationship to the world around them. The shaman doesn't invent those stories himself, but he does perform them in unique ways so that the oral tradition of the society is constantly evolving through the generations. Here's what Bart says about this shaman figure. In ethnographic societies, the responsibility for a narrative is never assumed by a person, but by a mediator, shaman, or relator whose performance, the mastery of the narrative code, may possibly be admired, but never his genius. A mediator, or medium, is like a channel, a conduit through which something flows. The conduit does not create, it just transmits. So Bart suggests that any act of authorship 
is the transmission of what he calls a narrative code. The author may perform that narrative code in a somewhat unique way, but he or she does not invent it out of thin air. It's transmitted through the storytelling practices of the society. Consider, for instance, the story of Romeo and Juliet. We're all familiar with that one, right? The story of forbidden love between two youths from rival families. It's been performed on stage thousands of times, each performance a little different from every other performance. But we wouldn't say that the performers who bring us a unique performance of Romeo and Juliet have authored something new, would we? Probably not. But this gets a little more tricky when we think about the hundreds of different adaptations of the Romeo and Juliet story. It's been told in hundreds of different ways, with different settings, different characters, and different tones, but always with the same basic narrative structure. You want a Looney Tunes version of Romeo and Juliet? Take your pick. You want an anime version? We have that too. You want Romeo and Juliet as a commentary on race? Yep, we can do that. Same-sex relationships? No problem. How about a high school musical version? Unfortunately, yes, we have that too. So, how do we talk about authorship here? The creative teams who bring us these retellings of the Romeo and Juliet story have certainly given us unique creative products, but they haven't really authored the story of Romeo and Juliet, have they? Aren't they more like the shaman than the author god? Aren't they just talented conduits for a narrative code that existed long before them? I mean, we all know who the real author is, right? That Shakespeare guy who wrote the original Romeo and Juliet sometime in the 1590s? He's our author god, right? A true creative genius rather than just a shaman passing along a pre-existing narrative code? Well, maybe not. The story of Romeo and Juliet appears in a collection of stories called Palace of Pleasure, written by William Painter in 1567. But even that was after the poem, The Tragical History of Romeus and Juliet, was published by Arthur Brooke in 1562. So is Brooke our author god? Our origin point for this narrative code? Well, Brooke's story was, for the most part, a translation of a 1559 publication by French writer Pierre Launay. But Launay's story was itself a translation of Giulietta e Romeo, an Italian story composed by Matteo Bandello in 1554. And Bandello's story was a rewriting of Luigi de Porto's story with the same title published 30 years earlier. And guess what? De Porto's story is a rewriting of the story of Mariotto and Gianosa, written by Masuccio Salernitano in 1476. So have we finally found our author god? Not really. Salernitano's story is really just a rewriting of the story of Pyramus and Thisbe as it appears in the Metamorphoses, a long poem written by the classic Roman poet Ovid in the year 8 AD. But all the various stories that appear in Ovid's poem are themselves derived from ancient Greek mythology. The myth of Pyramus and Thisbe was one that explained the origins of an important river in the region, the Pyramos River, now called the Sehan River. So, where is our author god? This particular narrative code stretches back into the oral traditions of the ancient world. There is no identifiable origin point. Now, a structuralist theorist would argue that this is the case not just for Romeo and Juliet, but for any and all acts of literary expression. All authors are really shamans rather than author gods. All works of literature are performances of structures that existed long before that particular performance. Now, each performance is unique. Each shaman brings something new to the narrative code, and thus these narrative codes or structures evolve over time. But no one invents anything entirely new, entirely outside of any pre-existing structure. That would be like speaking without language. But we'll get to that. So, when we encounter a piece of literature, how do we know what is original to it and what comes from a pre-existing structure? The only way to do this is through comparative analysis, comparing multiple works to each other to identify their common elements. Through this type of comparative analysis, we learn more about the structure that the individual work performs, and we learn more about the individual work as a unique performance of that structure. And this is the task of the structuralist critic.
One good example of this comes from Claude Levi-Strauss, a very famous structural anthropologist of the 20th century. Levi-Strauss studied the myth cycles of various indigenous cultures and began to notice many similarities between the myth cycles of different cultures from all over the world and from different time periods. Through in-depth comparative analyses, he identified certain widespread mythological structures that, he argued, tell us important things about humanity itself, while the different iterations of those myth structures in different cultures tell us important things about those particular cultures. We might extend this to say that an individual's unique performance of a cultural myth would tell us important things about that particular individual. But without comparative analysis, we wouldn't really know what is unique to that individual's performance. Like the formalist, we would just assume that the performance as a whole is entirely unique and that the performer is not really a performer, but instead an author god. But the structuralist critic, who has done comparative analysis, knows better. Okay, so at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that structuralist literary theory has its roots in the structural linguistics of Ferdinand de Saussure. To understand Saussure's linguistic theory, let's think back to Roland Barthes' shaman metaphor. Barthes' metaphor suggests that the author is not an author god who creates something out of nothing. He or she is instead a medium, or a conduit, who gives us a somewhat unique performance of a pre-existing narrative code. Now, let's replace the word author with speaker, and the words narrative code with language, or what Saussure referred to as long, and the words literary work with speech act, which Saussure referred to as parole. These are French terms. Now we have the basic idea of structural linguistics. Every time we speak, we deliver a unique speech act, but we're only capable of delivering speech acts that are possible within the lexicon and the rules of the language that we are speaking. And that language existed long before the individual who uses it to perform speech acts. So to what degree is it actually the individual speaking? And to what degree is it the language itself speaking? This is the same question that we might ask about a literary work like Romeo and Juliet. To what degree is it Shakespeare speaking? And to what degree is it the pre-existing narrative code speaking? Now, one might observe that there's an important difference here. A language is something much bigger and much more fluid and manipulable than a narrative code. So the language user might be understood to have much more freedom to create unique speech acts than the author who has to conform to the more restrictive norms of storytelling in order to make his or her narrative comprehensible to others. There's certainly some truth to this. The languages that humans use today are enormous and incredibly flexible so that we have the ability to manipulate and use them in truly countless ways. Countless, but not infinite. No existing language is infinitely large or infinitely manipulable. In other words, any language that we might use carries within it certain restrictions on what we can communicate and how we can communicate it. Now, here's where things get really post-humanist, because for Saussure, a restriction on what we can speak is also a restriction on what we can think. Within his structural theory of linguistics, Saussure essentially reversed the conventional understanding of the relationship between language and ideas. Within the conventional understanding, a language is a set of arbitrary signs mapped onto a pre-existing set of concepts or ideas. The word arbitrary means not necessary. So people have long understood that the relationship between any given linguistic sign or word and an idea is not a necessary or natural relationship. It's a relationship established by convention. For instance, there's no necessary or natural relationship between this thing, or more accurately, the idea that this image creates in our mind, and the English word fire. Just as there is no necessary or natural relationship between the idea that this image creates in our minds and the English word water. If we all suddenly agreed to call the first idea water and the second idea fire, well, that would be fine. There would be no reason why that couldn't work. It's just that as the English language has evolved through the centuries, its speakers have come to agree that the first idea should be called fire and the second idea should be called water. So 
This understanding of an arbitrary mapping of words onto ideas is based on two related assumptions that Saussure's theory rejects. The first assumption is that ideas exist before words are mapped onto them. The second assumption, which follows logically from the first assumption, is that we may possess a whole world of ideas that are not yet encoded in language. This is another way of saying that our ideas, our minds, are not restricted by the limits of our language. But according to Saussure, ideas only take shape through language. Psychologically, he wrote, our thought, apart from its expression in words, is only a shapeless and indistinct mass. Without the help of signs, we would be unable to make clear-cut, consistent distinctions between two ideas. Without language, thought is a vague, uncharted nebula. There are no pre-existing ideas, and nothing is distinct before the appearance of language. Saussure agreed that the connection between a word and an idea is arbitrary, but he argued that the idea only takes shape through the word. This has profound implications because it means that the mind of an individual, the whole conceptual experience of the individual, is shaped through language, which means that our powers of perception, thought, and understanding are confined within the limits of our language. We cannot have ideas beyond the limits of the lexicon and rules of the particular language or languages that we happen to have inherited. And for Saussure, this has profound implications for how we perceive and understand the world around us because, he argued, the relationship between language and the external world is arbitrary, which also means that the relationship between our ideas and the external world is arbitrary. To understand what this means, let's look at this picture of a tree. Now, our language allows us to have an idea of a tree as an individual organism. But in connection with the tree idea, we also have ideas about tree parts, like trunk and branch. Within the history of human experience, let's say, it has been useful for people to distinguish between the idea of trunk and the idea of branch. But the reality is that this is an arbitrary distinction. If we zoom in to the place where branch meets trunk, can we really identify a specific place where branch stops and trunk starts? If we used a microscope to view this connection at a cellular level, would we see where branch cells stopped and trunk cells began? No, because the distinction between branch and trunk is a conceptual difference, a linguistic difference. It's one that is useful to us as humans, but there's nothing about the external world that makes this distinction inevitable or necessary. For instance, imagine that you're a termite living in and feeding off the wood of this tree. You would have no need to distinguish between a branch part of the tree and a trunk part of the tree. There would be no difference between them to you. So if there were such a thing as a termite language, it probably wouldn't have words for branch and trunk, and therefore our talking termites would not have the ideas of branch and trunk. In other words, the distinction between branch and trunk has nothing to do with the tree itself it has to do with how we, as human creatures, interact with the tree. To get a somewhat different perspective on this, look at these two pictures. They look pretty similar, right? But the picture on the left is a distant aerial view of a dense forest, while the picture on the right is a much closer view of moss. Now, just as our idea of tree carries with it the related ideas of branch and trunk, our idea of forest carries with it the related idea of individual trees. A forest is made up of trees. But an individual tree by itself is something very different from a forest, right? An individual tree standing alone would not call to mind the idea of forest. Now think about the moss. Our idea of moss is very different from our idea of forest. It doesn't carry with it the idea of individual parts that are not by themselves moss the way that an individual tree is not by itself a forest. But in fact, this patch of moss is very much like a forest. It's a clustered group of individual organisms. Interestingly, however, we don't really have words that distinguish individual moss organisms from clusters of moss organisms. Both things are just moss to us. In fact, 
I'm guessing that some people watching this video have never even considered the fact that when they see moss, they're looking at a cluster of individual organisms rather than a single organism. It's a distinction that just doesn't have much use for us, so we don't have the language for it. But again, whether or not we make such a distinction has less to do with the external world itself than it does about how we, as humans, interact with that external world. Imagine that human beings were as large as the largest mountains, or even larger. If we were large enough, we might think about forests and trees the same way we currently think about moss. We would have no need to distinguish between individual trees, so we would have no concept of tree distinct from our concept of forest. We might be vaguely aware that a carpet of forest consists of individual forest organisms, but we wouldn't really have a separate word or concept for those organisms. They would just be forest, the same way that individual moss organisms are just moss. The point here is that, according to Saussure's theory of structural linguistics, ideas do not come directly or naturally from the external world. It's better to think of them as tools that are useful for us in navigating that external world as human creatures. If we were a radically different type of creature with a radically different relationship to the same external world, if, say, we were as large as mountains or as small as termites, or if we used sonar instead of eyesight, we would have a radically different tool set of ideas. And since there are no distinct ideas without language, we would have a radically different linguistic system. And every individual who inherited that linguistic system would have only the type of mind and only the types of ideas that were possible within that linguistic system. There would be no thought, no consciousness, no awareness that transcended or moved beyond the confines of that linguistic system. Well, we may not be able to move beyond the confines of our linguistic systems, but it's time to move beyond the confines of this video. In just a moment, you'll see in-video links to other Hilliard at Home videos, and you can also find links to other videos and e-courses. You should also check e-courses for any quizzes, assignments, or discussion boards related to this video. Thanks for watching.